Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, Ladies and Gentlemen, welcome to this evening, which already has started to be hot, a hot discussion before we even started to talk. Uh, last week, I was reading newspapers, magazines, uh, blogs, different texts, like I do always, as it is my job as a journalist, not more and not less. And I was very astonished because among all these articles that I found in the newspaper and in magazines and in blogs, within the, seven last, within the last seven days I found 12 articles that were talking about autonomous driving of the future. Also, when we look at this exhibition that we see here at the MAC today, Hello Robot, uh, sometimes it seems or we have the feeling that autonomous driving will come not in 20 years, not in 10 years or five years, but tomorrow. What we are interested in is what exactly is the reality? Why is there such a huge gap between uh, media and between what scientists do and what scientists write and about and do research on? And what exactly makes an ITS, an inter intelligent transportation system, intelligent? This is what we will be talking today about. We will talk about how urban mobility is going to change fundamentally with autonomous driving. Uh, how built environment will have to uh, be rethought and how also we, all of us, the human beings, will have to adapt to new ideas, to new technologies and maybe also to a completely newly live lift way of mobility, let's put it this way. Uh, this very unique Mac night today, this event is a cooperation between Mac Future Lab, as you can see it here, uh, the research project Avenue 21, the Austrian company Austria Tech, and the Vienna University of Technology. I hope I didn't forget any. Pardon? It's fun. Uh, I'll mention that in a minute, yeah. Um, my name is Wojtek Chaya, I'm a journalist for architecture and I will be very happy to be the facilitator for this event today. And before we start, I would like to tell you just two, three sentences about Avenue 21 research project. Uh, it's a two-year research project uh, that at the uh, Future Lab of the Vienna University of Technology, which is supported by the Daimler and Benz Foundation. It's an interdisciplinary team working uh, working on different systems uh, and also uh, different ways of implementing uh, technology and autonomous driving uh, in the future. Um, the focus of uh, this uh, research project is the new uh, mobility in European cities. Also, I have to mention that the event today is being recorded and don't be afraid it's not going to you're not going to be seen on television but it will be uh, for the Mac YouTube channel so enough said for now I would like to introduce the panel to you uh, Matthias Mitteregger next to me he studied architecture and is assistant at the Vienna University of Technology his main focus is architecture theory and the context of urbanity and human beings He's the project leader of this two-year research project, Avenue 21. Arjan van Timmeren, he's professor at the Technical University of Delft and chair of the Environmental Technology and Design Research Group. Uh, since 2015, he's also principal investigator at the AMS Institute, which is the Amsterdam Institute for Advanced Metropolitan Solutions. His focus is integrating technology-based metropolitan solutions for sustainable cities. Next to him, Katja Schechtner. She studied architecture and works today as a scientist. She is research fellow at the MIT Media Lab, where she runs two research teams on urban mobility. Most recently, she has joined the OECD in Paris as innovation agent to build a team assessing the social, cultural, and political impact of radical 
which is new technologies. Next to her, Graham Parkhurst. He's been working as a social scientist for 25 years now. He was part of the project Innovate UK, and he has published several books on new mobility strategies and new and driverless vehicle technologies, and also their impact on city and society. He's professor of sustainable mobility and director of the Center for Transportation Society at the UWE, University of the West of England in Bristol. You see it's very long CVs today that we have. Uh, next to him, Amelie Klein. She used to be a journalist, uh, among others, for the Austrian daily newspaper Die Presse. Today she works as curator and cultural theorist, and she is one of the curators of this exhibition that I've just mentioned before, Hello Robot, that was originally shown at the Vitra Design Museum, and is today, you will also have the opportunity to visit this exhibition later, today shown uh, here at the MAC. And next to her, Martin Rus. He studied urban planning and regional planning and did some research on mobility and traffic technologies. And for the last six years, he's been CEO of the Austria Tech Company, which is a community-oriented company owned by the Austrian federal government and uh, works for the Ministry of Transportation, Innovation and Technology. I would like to start uh, to talk with you or to ask you very briefly, uh, when we talk about autonomous driving, have you ever been sitting in such a vehicle? Have you ever used any assistance, any driving or any parking assistance? Who would like to give us a very short private expertise? Yes, I did. and. I feel fine, so for me it was not a problem. I'm, I'm a tech nerd, I, I have to admit. And um, I think those things that we now can try are, we are operating in safe mode, so there's, there's no reason to fear about shuttles, about uh, assistance functions. I think it's, of course, with a little bit of curiosity, it's, it's easier to kind of get into this feeling maybe that we encounter when it's not only us in one car, when it's many cars around and then when you start closing your eyes maybe and getting driven and not kind of being active in a, in a, in a mode of choice anymore. I think this will change the perception also. It did at least for me. And so I'm feeling much more fine in any shuttle concepts going with enormous eight kilometers an hour than maybe being driven automatically with 130 kilometers an hour on the highway. But I still have to ask you, what kind of vehicle was it that you were sitting in? A Navia shuttle, an Easy Mile shuttle, uh, a Tesla, an Audi, and a Mercedes. So I tried already several different kinds. I'm not going to ask you on a favorite ones. Thank you. Next one was Katja. Uh, thanks, uh, Wojtek, and thank you for the invitation and coming on this uh, really hot night tonight. Um, uh, so I was kind of lucky because we built our own uh, self-driving vehicles at uh, MIT. And the latest one I've been sitting in is actually a tricycle, so not a car. It you know, has, because we wanted to develop an urban solution uh, that would be small, has a small energy footprint, and can run on a typical European bike lane. And it's actually currently running um, in Taiwan. Uh, and the other one was in Singapore, where we also were part of the developing an, um, a campus shuttle um, with uh, one of our startups. Did you do a trip on your own? Uh, yes, uh, in the tricycles, but however, it was in a not within the daily traffic, it was a kind of a gated community. Thank you. It's fun. Graham. So we have a test vehicle at our university. It's a kind of Land Rover. And I have sat in the driving seat, not driving, with the test engineer next to me. And maybe because I know the engineers, but people talk about problems of trust, but I quickly found that uh, I was maybe too much trusting for the system. And when you have to take back control from the computer, you have to remember, oh yes, now it's down to me. And this maybe is one of the issues that we need to address. Thank you. What about the other three? 
one thing that I I was in in Berlin at there is a there is a test facility of the Deutsche Bahn where they have a Oli shuttle. It's a 3D printed version of an urban transport vehicle, and the experience that I mostly take, took from from riding it is how basic it was. It was really it felt like um, yeah like a, real, a true prototype. Um, it was um, bumpy. It was um, uncertain which which path to take, and um, I think it's it, it was in a way a reality check riding it. Um, um, to um, level your expectations on what technology is already capable of doing. So th that was a rather bumpy experience. Yes, there was uh, the. It, it's a closed. It's, it's like a, you said. It, it's a closed areal uh, where the Imotset is. Uh, it's a huge um, research uh, lab is situated, and but within that areal, other other, other um, transport modes are driving. There's ca there's cars. There's um, the cyclists. There was a construction site, so there were many issues for the for the car that couldn't that, that it couldn't solve at that point. Um, so it was very interesting to see how far technology um, is working and where are the ends right now. Thanks a lot, Arian, and after that, Amelie. Yes, well, uh, <clears throat> I had similar experiences to be honest. Uh, so it is something which, in the, at first, it really needs you need to get uh, used to it. So in, in, at first, it feels like in, in, inconvenient. It, uh, you would like to really interfere. You would like, but it, it, you get used to it quite fast. And um, but the most, um, I think, the most difficult was, but I was in a, in, a, in also in a, in a Tesla uh, drive on a, a road which was quite curved and it did not work as well as expected still so then you still are not too confident about technology so um, you need always to have this kind of fallback scenario and it was uh, stated before so what's what is the moment when you have to uh, where's the tipping point eh? so when is it when are you confident that technology works and when doesn't it and that's that's a question which is very difficult to answer if you are in the car because you see a real uh, rotating and okay so that's the kind of feedback which needs uh, to be developed further, I think, the coming years. Thank you. Amelie? Um, well, unlike anyone else on this panel, I have not been driving a self-driving car, but... You are not the only one. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but I would claim, as everyone prob probably in this, in this house, most people, I would claim, um, we've all sat in self-driving vehicles. Um, for example, taking us from Terminal 1 to Terminal B at most airports in this world. Um, and also, we, uh, anyone who drives a car that is probably um, younger than, I would say, I don't know, five years maybe, or, or ten even, um, drives in a semi-robotic system, at least a semi-robotic vehicle, um, with parking assistance and with you know systems that are built into this vehicle that take over in case of, I don't know, you have a seizure or um, a blackout or whatever. So we, we, we are all already sitting in, in these cars. And, and I would like to, to take the discussion into um, what, what I think is, is very probably the, the near future of self-driving uh, uh, or autonomous uh, traffic, and that's public traffic. I think this is way more relevant than you know us sitting in luxurious cars with a little robot serving drinks. <laughs> I don't think this is very realistic. Thank you for those first glimpses. Um, for the first 30 minutes, we'll stay here at the panel, and after that, I will open to the audience. So, uh, whatever kind of question you have. Uh, please feel free to ask them, uh, and the panel will be very happy to answer your questions. So I'll come back to you in 30 minutes. I would like to start to talk with you, uh, war is technic today. War exactly is development today. I mentioned before that what I read in media, what I read in lifestyle magazines, what I read in, in newspapers, after those briefing discussions that I had with you on the phone, I have the impression that this is a completely different thing than what you're working on and what you're confronted with today. 
so can you give us a short, maybe a correction of our, um, of, of our point of view? What exactly is the state of technique, state of art right now? Should I maybe start? Um, so I think there's a big difference between being a, a vehicle being able to perform a certain activity on a test track and being able to perform that in all weather conditions, all circumstances, on a, a real public road or indeed in a pedestrianized area. So we're a very long way from commercializable, reliable technology, even if we have the capabilities in principle now that can be demonstrated to journalists or indeed uh, demonstrated on, on roads such as with the, the Google car in, in the United States but in very particular constrained circumstances that can function. Well, to, to add to that, um, I think, well, I, then I reflected to research we are doing with uh, the, the AMS Institute, which is MIT and TU Delft uh, jointly. And um, it is not only about automated cars and engineering related to LiDAR, to let's say the technology to improve precision of automated vehicles, but it's also, and this is the most the latest status quo, is that we, aim to see at, the, let's say, the systems perspective. So robot to robot or automated vehicle to automated vehicle, um, let's say, interaction. Because this makes that you can really, uh, if you look at the city as a system, you can really improve the city. So we did thorough studies on, the, for instance, the taxis in New York. And uh, that led to, let's say, that with same um, surface level and comfort, we could reduce actually uh, to a quarter of the total amount of uh, taxis for a city like New York, which is quite a, a lot in that, in that city. So you, you could really realize on the cities, and that's also uh, connecting to your statement before, that the shared mobility, that, that would be the first, let's say, application, I think, which we will see in cities, uh, which is uh, either, either Uber or taxi kind of, uh, or waste collection kind of uh, 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 applications. And this, this is actually, this is, um, is intelligence between robots or the system optimization, which is algorithms, actually. Uh, that's what we are working on, mostly. But are we talking about, uh, Katya, are we talking about level five cars? This is what I learned this week uh, and last week when I was talking to the ladies and gentlemen. So cars that are really able to drive autonomously, completely, or are we talking about level three or level four cars or systems, which is, let's say, only like a support or like a help? So what exactly are we working on today? Well, I think within your question lies the answer because there is a timeline of introducing those uh, different kind of autonomy. And this depends on the question we are trying to solve. And in the urban culture, we are trying to implement it. So will we see autonomous driving quite quickly in gated communities, uh, may it be in the US for elderly residents, may it be in the Singapore or Manila gated communities where people shuttle around in autonomous cars, yes, we will have that, or, or shuttles, I'm not only talking about individual cars. Yes, we will have that quite quickly because it's, a, it's an environment that to a certain uh, level you can control. Same in the real world uh, components where we talk a lot about freight goods and freight movement that is in some way autonomous. Um, I mean, Martin and I have been working in this field for years and years and from the Elektronische Deichsel to whatever it is now, it's, it's, it's coming, it's out there. And it's actually um, just to make a point on, oh my God, all these truck drivers will lose their work we will have in the next 25 years a million truck drivers less than we need in Europe because no one wants to go in this. I mean, it's not like your favorite job, jobs. So this is also why there is actually a push. So this is, this is, depends on where you look, depends on what state you look, and depends if you can set some uh, constraints. We will be there quite quickly. And I say that because I personally work, and this is, this is something I like about here. We're talking about automated vehicles. And I'm working on drones for urban transportation for people and freight and the restraints and where we should put it. And before I hand over to Martin, because he can probably say a lot more about the regulatory framework, the social things is, I also want to say that I usually refuse to discuss autonomous driving 
without the Holy Trinity of autonomous, electric, and shared, I don't think we can split those, and based on a backbone of a strong public transit. So this is, this is for me, the thing that's kind of done. But of course, we have to get there on the regulatory side. Let's stay with the Holy Trinity, Martin, just a minute, because I saw that some people were saying yes, and some people were laughing here. Um, do you agree with this Holy Trinity? Of course, I agree with the Trinity, and uh, because the cooperative and connected part is from the systems approach that Arian also pointed out, I think very important. But also let me come back to your, your basic question, what we see and the expectations we, we see and hear in the media and what's real. I think, of course, th there's a certain gap of experience and expectations. But why? Of course, because all these tech companies, car manufacturers, new service providers, they have to generate a future shareholder value on that. And so, of course, they are working on these specific functionalities, on what a vehicle is possible to do, possible to sense, and how it is steered with artificial intelligence tools and deep learning algorithms and whatever, one thing. But, of course, what they not tell, uh, because maybe it's not that sexy. I'm also not quite sure if the vehicle itself is, the automated vehicles has this kind of strong emotional touch. I don't believe in that. Uh, but nevertheless, it's there because everybody is talking about, especially politicians. Um, but you need the framing for it. So on, in which kind of operational environments we can put these kind of vehicles? And of course, in general, we are looking for automated, shared, connected, electrified, and whatever. But in, in, in practice, we have to be very specific on what we do where. So of course, the platooning things or energy efficient convoys, as we call them now, uh, because platooning is a bad word and it's so martial and whatever uh, uh, kind of um, uh, feeling on that, that some trucks are going uh, by, them, by their own. Of course, we have certain problems on that. So, but I think it's always this accompanying measure that we often forget that who is controlling and steering the system? What kind of tools do we need? And how do we put the physical and the digital layers of our infrastructure in correlation with these vehicles? And more important even to that, how we put that in correlation to what we want from our transport system and from the world we live in? Thank you. I, Thank you. Um, I want to, one, one, one thing that I found curious or, or at first, when, I, when we started the project, we were also looking at the media and obviously there is such an information overload and such a hype on that, on, that, on that topic. And I think the interesting question would be why is there such a hype? And I would, I would say um, this is due to the fact that um, humans have a special relation towards technology. We are dependent on that and we change with technology and transport technolo technology is even more so. So we have, for example, like the idea of a weekend trip to Barcelona that is really affordable, that's a rather recent thing. And it totally changes our relation towards the world. We have a new opportunity and we make use of it. And that, is, that has fundamentally changed in the past. When we think of the car, it really created new cities, it, re it created new communities. And I think this is at the core where, the, where this, why there is such an excitement in so many disciplines and so, and, and so much excitement also in the, in the popular media. When I... Uh, go yeah, ahead. Well, yeah, I, I would also to, 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 let's say, pose a first negative comment on, let's say, all this... Go ahead and help me, because I was uh, about to. Yeah, okay, so... Now, because that's, that, that's the other... If you ask for why is this buzz, it's also because people f fear what's not known, and also because, actually, they, they should. Because, in a way, um, I think we are also very optimistic, techno-optimistic. And so, adaptation uh, by users is also something um, which is something which is overestimated, and uh, especially in, 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 let's say, inner town, existing inner town uh, environments, it's really something uh, far away from today still, implementation. Um, uh, it's famous that people are malleable, huh? so people, if, if you know a car will stop, you might cross the street because it will stop. Uh, there's all kinds of influences that people will anticipate on 
behavior of a car. And there's also all kinds of ethical issues, like um, if there's a little girl on the street and there's two elderly people in the car will the, and the car cannot stop anymore, will it, will it turn to a concrete wall? Or, uh, so decisions are to be made, and these are actually algorithms made by an engineer. So he has a very ethical uh, kind of uh, dimension. It uh, has a work. huge ethical dimension, but it's not done only by an engineer. There is, there is, for example, the, the uh, moral machine where, where everybody can currently contribute uh, in questions like this. It's an online game where you look at it and decide if you are in a car, should it run over the little girl or sacrifice the elder people or should it uh, sacrifice other people or whatever. So it's the decisions we have to make will be ethical, of course, constraints, but there is a a huge amount of research that's going on, as well as communicating with a car where no driver is in there, or where currently when a car comes, you're a pedestrian, you look at the driver, you kind of make an eye contact, and then you know to go. Well, you know, guys, we developed um, lights that can look at you and blink at you and say, okay, it's okay to go through. I mean, we have some German opportunities also where you have just uh, a sign on top of a car where it says, it's safe to go, probably not as fun and as, as, as interrelated uh, as you do with a, a, a person, uh, which is why we try to engineer this. Uh, and yes, uh, there will have to come together a society and a discussion like we do today here on what we want. But please look on the discussion of how much we would need electric light and how long that would take to implement and how long it actually took or please go and buy this wonderful book in Austria that's called um, uh, Berufe, die man auch mal hätte werden können, Mundwäscherin und Korvettenkapitän in Österreich. There is also the, same, the similar amount of all these people who fed the horses and made the things to run the horses. So those changes, yeah. a lot of the times go quicker than we anticipate, but of course not within a year. But, you mentioned, uh, uh, Martin, just a minute, I would like to come to Amelie first uh, and, and, uh, and then also to you. Uh, Katja mentioned the moral machine and in the exhibition Hello Robot uh, there is a project, uh, if, I'm mistake, if I'm not mistaken, it's by Automato Farm where uh, three different programs uh, were, uh, let's say, tested can you tell us something about this project and about the results also? Because I think that's a very interesting project. So um, it's, it's basically um, the designers um, pre-programmed. It's, it's fiction, of course. It's not, it's not a real car. It's, it's, it's a, um, an experiment. They pre-programmed uh, three cars by three different priorities, sets of priorities. One would be humanistic values. So, you know, we've had it. Um, the little girl goes, of course, first and not the elderly people and uh, groups go before individuals etc to um, profit so cost efficiency what's the cheapest solution and three was maximum protection for the driver and then they sent these uh, three pre-programmed cars into the same um, accident scenarios and as you can imagine, the outcome is very different. And I think this is really interesting because it, it makes very, you know, it, it's, it makes very clear and very visible um, how much this is actually based on, on ideology rather than technology. And I think this is something that we have to discuss too, that, you know, behind the machine, there is no ethics, there's no moral, there's, even if it's crowdsourced, there's code and the code follows an agenda. And I think it's very naive to think that the agenda is the same as, as mine, you know? I don't think I would be uh, buying a car that wouldn't, you know, be protecting me. Or at least, you know, I'm not, maybe I might not be driving alone. I might be driving with my five-year-old. And let me tell you, I would be very much make sure that I'm sitting in a car that, that totally protects my girl, you know? And so I, I think there are a few issues, even if I think this crowdsourcing thing is really interesting that, you, that, you, that you're talking about, but, but I'm not sure um, if that will really save the problem. Also because I, I, I'm not an expert as, as much as, as all of you are, but, but I read this um, um, study where, where people are much more um, inclined to forgive other people 
but they're totally not inclined to forgive a machine. And I think this is, this is you know, we're all humans after all. And we work very, you know, we're very irrational. And I don't think that, I think crowdsourcing is, a, is, a, is an interesting approach to this, but I'm not sure if it's really the answer. So you reserve the right to kill? I mean, I'm trying to be provocative. In the car with your five-year-old, you would drive into 10 other five-year-olds? So this is, this is basically, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, this is the questions we have to answer. So this is not, this is not, this is exactly the questions we will have to answer for but different you know, societies because yeah. other societies will kill the five-year-old over the elderly people because they are more valued. But so, and this is why we will have to be very careful about that. And if things. they are living machines, we forgive them. Ah. Is it, is it, this is a <laughs> kind of narrative. Like but uh, the thing uh, is, but the thing is also the preparing for the unexpected could not be an ethical dimension somehow, or it's a very, very, let's say, um, complicated ethical dimension. And always these kind of moral machine things that are dealing with expected situations, but a system or a vehicle put in a system could, under normal condition, okay, I can adapt my speed, uh, I can adapt my risk and whatever, so this is exactly, of course, it's a promise of automated vehicle and automated and connected and cooperative vehicles that we will have less accidents and so on. We see a, ten ten we see a, a tendency towards having less accidents uh, and safety, but in the end, also the safety benefits that we might get from, out, from, from automated vehicles or automation in general are maybe the only really concrete ones, but because we won't have any positive effects on the network, on our efficiency, capacity, and maybe also not uh, on, on, on urban environments if we are not searching and implementing dedicated solutions that have a certain specific limitation. So it's not the free movement for free cars initiative. Yes. But I think this is almost a showcase how many, many, many um, discussions on autonomous driving go because first we say, uh, we should talk about public transport. Then we say uh, level three, four, five, and five being furthest away, five really being uh, an autonomous actor that is a car, that is a machine that we um, give some amount of freedom of choice to. We attribute freedom of choice to. And that obviously being very far in the future. Never. Um, if ever. So um, I think we have maybe uh, these questions are not as urgent as they might seem, I would say. There are other questions of great relevance to, um, I think, uh, cities, to uh, societies to ask that, that are not ethical of, about uh, running over girls or elderly, um, but um, framing the way we want future cities to look like. That is, for example, um, public transport, what role would it be? What would it look like? What, how, how can we get people to drive on it? Or what is the kind of mobility we really want to have for, 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 um, for our cities of the future? Because we know um, that mobility is a huge factor um, and on, for example, carbon footprint, but also spatial mobility relates to uh, social mobility. And these are very important and way more urgent questions than the um, ones we just discussed, I think. Thank you. Graham. Yeah, I'd like to agree that we can overplay the importance of these ethical debates. And they're great for philosophers, and it's good that society has philosophers, so I'm glad we're having the debates. Keeps them in jobs. But we already have lots of automated vehicles, uh, aeroplanes, railway trains, and in some ways they already address these issues. Um, it seems to me that if the system is working properly, it should foresee these eventualities and avoid them. And if the system is not working properly, it may be so degraded that it's not even capable of making the decisions that our philosophers in their uh, armchairs can. So I, I'm, I agree we should turn the debate back on to the reality. Um, we've talked in terms of the trinity. So to continue the religious uh, metaphor, I think I'm a believer in the Trinity. That's the only way that we could deliver a world uh, heaven uh, of uh, automated vehicles in cities that we want to live in. The question is, can we actually get there? And then my faith, I'm afraid, is lacking because 
the vast amount of investment is going in from particular interests, the automotive interests, and whilst they may wish to develop level five vehicles, can they actually achieve that in a commercially viable way? What's to stop them arriving at level three? This is a vehicle which will drive itself on the highway, but you take back control when you get to the motorway junction and finish. This means that uh, your child could not travel alone in the vehicle. This means that you're still going to need a driving license. What's to stop the industry ending at that point? Uh, why should we be taken forward? So we will not actually see this wonderful revolution that we would like. Thank you. Let me ask you one question because I was planning to ask you uh, this safety and, 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 and moral and ethics aspect at the end of this discussion. And it just happened that we were just in the middle of, in, of it. I was not asking you for it and now we were talking 15 minutes uh, about killing people, about kids, about elderly people and about safety. And I saw that emotions were coming up because you were interrupting each other and people are of different you opinions. Ask for that. Does it mean does it mean that we're still not ready? No, we are not. We are just in testing mode. We are not ready for deploying this new technology really to a, a wider, uh, let's say, public users. It's not there. There, it's. It, I think first things we see, for instance, with the shuttles. Of course, first trials, they are working, but under very, very limited and constrained conditions. And actually, concerning implementing a shuttle somewhere, you cannot scale it. It's a, a, lot, a lot of effort to put them into a trial. I think this is, this is of course, need some, will need some years. We also see these trials for platooning, as mentioned by Katya. Uh, of course, yes, we did some truck platooning challenge in Europe where several platoons has gone to Rotterdam last year. Yes, but without any learning. They just went there. It was a hell of a mess to organize all that. And it's a nice brochure, but it's almost no learning on it. So how do we really manage then our highways to allow these kind of things? Also there, concerning the really adjustment of how we operate infrastructure and how these vehicles, these new automated vehicles run safely in conjunction in this transition mode with all the other legacy vehicles and users on the roads, this is still an unsolved question. Well, but I think, yes, on everything on the technical, but a society, a global society, to come to one answer to this question and stop the discussion, we will never be there because we are not there with anything from raising our kids to what we wear. So um, that we are in a current ongoing discussion means we are preparing ourselves yeah. to be ready and there will be a multitude of different answers and definitely it will not be us in Vienna giving it for the rest of the world including Manila, Jakarta and Nairobi or Buenos Aires or to jump to a way better cities or like more developed. So, I think the good news for all of us working in this area is we won't be out of jobs and that we probably can also tailor better urban transportation systems that reflect the cities, the cultures we live in and that we try to protect in a very specific localized way. We will have some regulations for everybody, but then we have very strong local actors to see what works for them. And it's, and it's together between, the, it's not only the, indus, the industry forcing, if you look at um, electric, uh, um, uh, electric, charging, uh, or, uh, yeah. or so power, we, power train. We have, we have people here from the regulatory side that join us um, and from all other places too. So I think we are ready because we are discussing it. Amelie. I, th I would like to pick up on something that you said. I think this, the, the, there are different agendas, and I think we should not be underestimating the, the enormous economical uh, business side of, of, of traffic, of individual traffic. Um, that, of course, you know, uh, I mean, that social change is possible. You know? <laughs> we, we've seen in the 60s, we've, we saw uh, people smoking in, in, in TV studios, and, and this has stopped. So maybe someday 
uh, men particularly, but also women, will stop, you know, driving and and and. Uh, associating driving a car with freedom and personal freedom, but but we have to think about all of these implementations that are being fed by an enormously powerful um, uh, um, business that's behind that. You know, I mean, look at look at car ads. It's it's pathetic. You know, they they always feed into the same the same things, and I think this is something that that why why would car industry favor public transport doesn't make sense um, I, I, I'm, I'm a bit pessimistic as to the to the uh, social and, and societal responsibility of it's a bit like t tobacco industry right I mean we can't really expect them to um, stop people from smoking right I would uh, just a minute Martin I would still like to talk with you about this topic because I think that's a very in interesting and important one social effects how do we have to change, how do we have to adapt, how do we have to rethink um, our operational environment and operational design, what do we have to do in order to make uh, autonomous driving possible. But before we do so, I would like to, uh, to come to you and ask the audience if there is already some questions that you would like to ask. If so, raise your hand and do we have a microphone for the audience? Okay. I'll come to you. I would like to address once more the ethic aspect of, of the whole thing. Because I think uh, there are two components which have been uh, talked about already. And I think it's very important what uh, Mrs. Klein says. That is, there is an in the industry an enormous interest in uh, uh, developing cars or um, programming it uh, to the benefit of the of the customer so uh, this even if there is an, a, a, a movement in society to to um, develop ethical standards it's going to uh, crash with these interests. And uh, the most important question to me is, who is going to decide what will be programmed into this autonomous vehicle? Because this is the most uh, essential issue. Thank, thank you. Uh, if there are more questions, I would like to collect two or three, and then we'll come back to the panel. Uh, another question in the, in the discussion about smart cities, which has been going on for many years, uh, like urban planning, which relies on the collection of data and the use of data, there has been uh, criticism of, or a question about what if the data uh, gets into the wrong hands. Uh, and the same maybe applies to, to autonomous driving, autonomous cars, maybe. Uh, like what if someone hacks your car, what if a terrorist hacks a car and makes it drive in, into a crowd? So how does technology respond to these fears or are these fears maybe not justified at all? Thank you. Thank you. Is there a third question? Maybe a more positive one? I'd be happy to hear that. Okay, then, then sorry to the panel. We came back to the ethics and moral questions again. So. Uh, I can we'll start to... with you, and then uh, one, the first question was oriented to Amelie, who does the programming? So, Matthias, go ahead. Well, I can try to give a positive answer on a difficult question, and that is um, these kinds of um, issues of different interests are just the foundation of a society. And you just colliding, colliding interests are at the very basis of anything and any change we know, and hence, all there is to say is we need processes to discuss it and ways and modes and this for example being one of that and democratic choices being a greater level of of it but i think this is a very fundamental issue it's not not something new with autonomous cars thank you uh, maybe one okay go one ahead. thing in addition because i think we are actually absolutely digging very deep exactly in this kind of f sphere that you just described and who is doing the programming, who is responsible and on what kind of testing and approval scheme 
No? Are you kind of, what are you relying to? Is it more a kind of software testing scheme or is it still a type approval scheme of vehicles? And I think there are totally different hemispheres on how these kind of engineering, how the certification or sometimes even self-certification of things are, are then happening. Where I say, okay, the transport sector is a kind of reluctant one on taking future risks. And the thing with the industry, yes, the industry is, of course, the, the big pressure group in behind, but not only in the field or in the sphere of having them automated vehicles, but the automated vehicles, they are a tool for getting new services out and new kind of value creation for automated uh, or for for automakers but also for new kind of t the new kids on the block like Google Uber and whatever of course there's a lot of pressure but it's then it's because it's it's or is it, this is exactly the reason why it's so important that we have this kind of debate also on the policy side and on the public side to create the different kind of narrative also together with the cities and citizens on what kind of types of vehicles and systems do we really like and do we want? Well, and, yeah, and, and to add to that, because I think this is important, because we have the supply side, and of course, what we are doing it for as a society is, of course, the demand side. Yes? We want mobility on demand, or we want mobility as a service. Yes? We want it comfortable, as clean as possible, the Trinity, uh, and as, uh, as fast as possible. But um, so that might oppose a bit to the to the produce side of of of, uh, of, of uh, car producers, but I think um, this is also almost an ethical question because we can improve the system. We will improve the system. It will become more efficient, hopefully more sustainable. But we should ask ourselves what will be done in a political level, or not, let's say on a societal level, with the, with the rooms, with the space, which we win. Eh? So will the room be spent to further growth of cities, more cars? And so that's also an important question to ask. So you can make a system more efficient, but if it's only meant to make the system bigger or larger or more people or higher buildings, then you, as a society, you don't gain anything. And so, of course, there's a demand for more people to house, but I think it's important to, to really level both supply and demand, but also to include this trinity, this livability uh, as a goal. Uh, so, so that I, I would say the qualitative aspects um, in intelligence. Eh? So often we are uh, optimizing on a quantitative base, sensing on short distance, and uh, we are actually doing a lot now with uh, social media scanning and a lot of um, feedback systems which we, we try to combine with this quantitative sensing so that we can really offer, let's say, a qualitative new level so that you can, if you choose a route from A to B, or your car chooses it, that you can make a distinction with is it perhaps the shortest route, like we are used to now, or is it perhaps the, the route in which you pollute less for the environment? Yeah, th those Th kind of you. qualitative aspects are very important. Um, Amelie, I'll, I'll be with you in a minute. Before we come to the second question, thank you for your very important question. I don't know if you're happy already with the answer. I'm not yet. Amelie, please help us. The question I was, who will be making the decisions and who will be the one to decide? I'm sorry. I, this is something I cannot um, answer. I, um, probably it's not going to be you. It's not going to be someone that has your agenda, that follows your agenda. And I think this is something that actually ties into what I was going to say. Um, interestingly, and we've been discussing this for, what, now 25 minutes, and the questions from the audience come. Um, uh, we've, and this is something that I, that I find so interesting in the discourse about robotics in general and autonomous systems, whatever they are. Um, we tend to be very much afraid of things that are not exactly, I believe, what we should be afraid of. We are afraid of, I don't know, synapses and connecting to, in, to computers and our brain cells being whatever uh, synchronized and we are afraid of hackers that will then drive our cars into uh, a Chris, Christmas Chris Kindle markt in, like in Berlin. <clears throat> And so on. We're afraid of, of, uh, of you know, the, the typical ethical dilemma, etc. It's the, the 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 ongoing trope of the robot that serves us and the robot that destroys us. And we know this from where, from popular culture. This is what we've seen so many times. Like we we all grew up with this image of the robot that will first serve us and then destroy us. And this is why we are afraid of these things that don't seem so realistic. And I think it's interesting that that I have the role now on this panel to say it's not probably not the most 
close, the, the closest um, thing that is going to happen. Much more interesting, I find, is if we speak about the Trinity and if we speak about shared, <coughs> shared uh, uh, um, vehicles, what I find, um, and maybe this ties into what you were saying or you wanted to know, um, I find it very uncomforting that even now, um, a few days ago actually, I was sitting in a car to go and the car would ask me, may I um, submit your data to whatever? The, 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 the moment I sat in, in that car, obviously the system knew who I was and wanted to sell my data. I think this is much more troubling. What happens if we all sit in these cars and we identify by, you know, whatever it is, maybe our wearables, and then we're basically, you know, working for the new kids on the block, as you call them, um, you know, those five big companies that basically control our, all our digital lives. And I think this is, this is much more something to be afraid of. What happens when we all sit in these cars? Everyone knows everything about us at all times. And I find this way more discomforting and it's much much closer than you know terrorists hacking self-driving cars or um, you know the, the 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 dilemma of the totally five five what five thingy car that goes we already do thank you I know yes we do we do but 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 this is something that we should be discussing yes we do that's that's yeah. terrifying we, we still be staying with this topic for hopefully not more than one or two minutes. Uh, Graham, the second question may I address to you. Uh, yeah, what do I, we have to do in order to protect ourselves from terrorists and from hacking? Well, uh, that's for a security expert, but what I can say is that already existing vehicles are highly attackable. Uh, somebody told me who works in the automotive industry that a typical modern car will have 105 surfaces electronically that could be hacked. So we've already seen uh, the possibility to hack a, a Jeep in the United States where it was brought to a halt. Uh, whether that's going to be worse with an autonomous vehicle, I don't know. Maybe it offers also some possibilities for the security services to, to intervene uh, if it's controllable remotely. Clearly once a vehicle has been taken control of currently it's very hard to stop. If I could just refer also to the previous comment, I feel more positive about this specific issue because it may be that one uh, CEO of an automotive manufacturer says we're going to build the car in a particular way, but actually uh, there's a, a more complex community required to deliver professionally one of these connected autonomous vehicles and the insurance industry and the legal companies are working much more closely in the actual design and development of these vehicles. They will need to understand exactly which sensor went wrong, exactly who put that piece of equipment on the vehicle and the idea that somebody could wave a magic wand and say the vehicle will prioritize this over that. I think the the technology is more complex and individual companies won't want to take the responsibility. A Japanese manufacturer that made faulty airbags went out of business yesterday. Um, so it's not just a big company that will be responsible, it's the individual component suppliers. Thank you. Katja first and then Martin and then we'll go to... I would like to end today with more positive feelings. We'll try, we'll try that. Katja. Okay, so, well, on the question of data um, security, uh, a little bit too early, I have a report out in May, uh, on technical solutions to both address the hacking, but also who has access to the data. One of this is called um, safe answers, so you only ask an answer to the people who hold one particular um, piece of the data and they will not give the data back, but only the answer that probably the Wiener Linien uh, need. So we are working on this as well on the institutions with the World Economic Forum or the OECD building institutions, oversight institutions. We did that for food safe safety. There was none 100 years ago. So uh, as a society, we, we tend to make sane and productive decisions around this too. So the institutional side and the technical side is working on it as well as we are currently exploring things like the blockchain uh, to make systems safer against um, 
any kind of uh, so cybersecurity, let's say. And the other thing is, there is tons and tons of things. I mean, like, you could, each and everybody could go out of you and poison the food supply on the Nashmarkt quite easy. You don't do it. So yes, we have to uh, make regula regulations. We have to protect against those few who do. But I'm also very positive that not most of us will suddenly try to take over a car to drive over a girl and elderly people. Yeah. Good. And Martin. And for specifically, I think for the vehicle, there are new uh, security regulations just put in place uh, out, let's say, as a result of an ongoing, of a long-lasting process on European level on the field of cooperative systems and how we make those kind of connect connectivity systems between vehicles and infrastructure safe. But of course, it's not only these components. You're connecting vehicle data, vehicle services with personal services. You're connecting infrastructures to infrastructure cl and, and cloud services and so on. And it's not the specific layer. So user service, vehicle services and so on. It's always the connection of the different elements that actually has some problems. I think people in our, our organizations in Japan and also in the US in some European countries has done a lot of research on that. And the problem is not the specific element. It's always the kind of the, the, the linkage of different sectors with different logics and different, let's say, types of regulations and things like those. But in the end, I think it's, it's, working, it's working quite well. But of course, we will never have a fail safe, 100% fail safe system, yeah? as you. we don't have it now. Uh, Matthias, who is the project leader of Avenue 21 Research Project, is already suffering a bit next to me because we are talking about killing and terroristic acts and, and hacking and young girls and elderly people. Uh, we have also two more questions, three more questions from the audience. Uh, we have 10 or 15 more minutes, and my, my hope is uh, to leave now this topic and maybe to come to some more uh, positive topics and also to more important ones because uh, we also have to talk about society, we have to talk about operational design, we have to talk about how to prepare politics and authorities and how to and, and, and what and also to regulations this is also something you mentioned in order to really make this possible so no no killing topics anymore and i'll start i just want to make it clear it was not uh, my idea that i um, um, uh, uh, said that bad issues are not allowed on that panel i didn't uh, at all want to have frame it that way thank you <laughs> so question number one um, I have a question about resources because, uh, as you said, the Holy Trinity is uh, important when we talk about automotive, we talk about electric. And um, when I hear Elon Musk, he says we need like hundreds of these gigafactories to sustain all to um, lithium iron batteries, all the energy that we need. Um, but the question I get asked a lot is, um, do we have enough of these resources to make all these lithium iron batteries and what happens with the waste and um, how long, how sustainable are they and yeah. Thank you. Question number two was you. Um, if these shuttles in the next five to 15 years come over all over the cities, the big cities, um, is it the end for the individualized car driving? And if it's so, or perhaps in future then, um, individualized autonomic cars um, will be there, but won't be, uh, won't be too, too expensive for the people. So. Okay, thank you. And question number three. The regulator was already alluded to on the panel, so I, um, I, I step out. Uh, I'm heading a very small team on uh, uh, transport decarbonization and mobility transformation, automatic driving at the, in the transport ministry, the Austrian transport ministry, automatic driving being one of our main topics. 
I get the feeling on the panel that there's a wish to speak about the Holy Trinity, which indeed I think uh, all of us, uh, be it the national level or the city level, is something we actually want to bring about. Uh, so I would like to ask the panel two very specific questions, um, because we are all asking ourselves how to bring this about. Um, I would very much like each of you to name me one person I could call on this topic and whom you think would have a really great idea on this and also share their phone numbers. Um, and second, what's, what's the first question I should ask, uh, given that the Holy Trinity uh, is indeed our aim and uh, just to p pinpoint that we're indeed taking this very seriously, we really have to crash down on our transport emissions and that's something we take very seriously. So, so using the technology to bring about what we want to achieve in terms of objectives is great. Um, I hope that's positive enough for you. Thank you. We're coming now on a meter level of this discussion. Thank you. So question number one was about resources and about giga, 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 giga factories. Who would like to start with that answer? I can do because I think it's, it's not an issue because if we are in the Holy Trinity, then we need less resources than we do now. Of course, sharing and pooling and new kinds of mobility services will not be the answer for everybody and every region and every part of, of our planet. But they can be the solution for many parts. And I think we have to go on that. And it's like, I think this kind of sh shared use of resources, we're putting new technologies in. So lithium ionic uh, batteries won't be the solution maybe in 20 years, but maybe we only need 10% of the vehicles as we need now in our fleet. So I think it's, it's not this kind of resource problem. It's just on how we, we manage things in a much better, better way and how we, let's say, Still, even if we go for the Holy Trinity and the service-oriented mobility landscape on how we get an emotional touch, because we are investing in emotions when, when buying a car, when going around. And if this is going away, who is going to capitalize all these kind of new systems in a sustainable way when we mix industry and private and public investments? And I think this is the most crucial question. I will also ask or recommend to Henriette, you should ask this. <laughs> but I don't know exactly whom you should ask. Thank you. I would still like to stay with the first uh, question still. So talking about resources, resources, uh, as I understood it correctly, hopefully also for batteries. Uh, do we have enough? And what will happen if we don't need them anymore? Who would like to? Uh, to take an answer. I'll have a go. Um, I, I don't think we're there with a solution for electric vehicles yet. Um, electric vehicles are part of the solution, but we will not be able to convert our entire electric, uh, our entire vehicle fleet to electric and solve the problem that way. Um, if you think about how many years we've been talking about electric vehicles, I believe now they are um, 0 0.1 percent of the UK of uh, the EU uh, total vehicle fleet so after all these years uh, even Norway with very very strong incentives just manages 14 percent of new vehicle sales and this is with subsidies allowed them, allowing them to use bus lanes 14 percent yeah so um, and there's no reason to assume that an autonomous vehicle would be an electric vehicle so uh, you're right, I think the question is important to raise in terms of the connections with uh, autonomous vehicles, but it's a somewhat separate issue, and we haven't solved that one either yet. Thank you. Question number two, uh, is autonomous driving, are shuttles, the end of individual driving of joy, of emotions? Who would like to go for that? I think it's really interesting. Um, Again, this is advertising. We have these images in our minds of, you know, these luxurious cars. I, I don't know how many people in, in this audience or the panel drive a really luxurious car. Okay. Um, so no I think. No one dares I, to say so. Uh, yeah, maybe. But I think the, the percentage is not that high. You know, we all expect um, autonomous individual uh, driving to be 
this luxurious experience. I think what's more um, probable is um, shared car, um, uh, so individual, but not individually owned, but individually used. And I think there's going to be, you know, there are going to be price systems, like um, with your with your mobile phone, you will have the opportunity to pay a higher flat rate, which will allow you to use your car individually rather than share it with others as you drive. And then it'll allow you to go on the faster lane, probably. And, and these are things that are being discussed. You know, this is something that uh, Jaguar is, is discussing. So can we pay more and then go faster? Um, th I think this is much more um, um, probable. So no, it's not the end of the individual. Um, the individual traffic and, and driving, it's just, uh, it's based on a different um, um, possession uh, system, or what do you call it? Yeah, and besides of that, of course, the, the new mo modes and the new concepts of sharing, actually, they, they, they are built on also um, offering different qualities of cars, eh? so that you, you, every day will be in a very effective small car, but you can also choose for the weekend for let's say the station wagon, or the, uh, if you want to go for a drive in the mountains uh, for a sports car, whatever. So, but still shared. Yeah? So that that's the idea. It's 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 um, mobility as a service. It's really that should be the basis. Yeah? And that's what, what I meant also before with that we should look more to the demand side, not to the supply side. And, that's, and then that's it's the question on what kind of emotion, what kind of emotion, do you kind of associate with having these kind of choice of moving freely yeah. somehow and drive how you want to drive and where where you want to drive and as fast you want to drive um, I think we have to think on that and there is also kind of a, a, a dialogue that we need of course because this is also something that the freedom of movement is is the freedom of choice and the freedom also on maybe pushing the limits somehow that we get something out of with with emotions that are kind of associated with different mobility needs and options but the end it, if we end up if automated vehicles or mobility is yes everything everywhere for everybody then you don't have any differentiation now and then you won't have a market because it's a collective good yeah? thank you katya well just to be clear the holy trinity includes electric shared and automated which and ba based on, as I said, the bedrock, the peter uh, of transportation, which is a strong mass transport public network. And as for the freedom, let me put it that way, all the gentlemen riders uh, with their big stables um, now can go to their riding schools and enjoy their um, skills there, and there is still some peat rides. So I think that's probably the way we will we'll go, probably, Europe and the US lagging behind, but if you ever sat in Manila traffic every day, um, the joy of driving or in Indonesia or Nairobi is um, less than expected. And to finish off for me, Benjamin de la Pena, uh, head of the Seattle DOT. Thank you. We'll continue with that. So uh, Henriette asked for some name droppings and question that she would uh, address to those people. Who would like to continue very shortly? <laughs> it would be great if, if it was that easy <laughs> um, that I could call someone uh, um, um, for that answer. I think there, as, as this discussion very nicely reflects, there is, um, it is even, I think it's very difficult in a sense to make the, dis the, the distinction who is sitting on the panel and is an expert with regard to the future and who is sitting in the audience. I think it's not, a, um, it's not an, easy, an easy decision to make. Um, we are ob obviously trying to answer a lot of open questions here. Um, and what I truly believe in is um, that whatever, we're talking now again about the autonomous, like the really autonomous car, I don't think it's going to be a car. Um, it's going to be something utterly different than to that what, what, what we are now associating with that. We, we are, we're in a way um, in the 80s where no email is invented and no, not even a chat room is there and we're speculating about smartphones really. 
So that is, that is how far it is um, I'm talking about truly autonomous vehicles. We, I don't believe in that there is anyone an expert in that, in, in, in that field. Um, um, and certainly no person I would, I would call. I think um, it is just truly important because um, from, from my perspective, um, um, looking at the effects that they are likely um, uh, with regard to cities, um, this discussion obviously needs to be speculative. I think we don't need to hold back. I think we need utopia. We need utopia. We, we don't. We don't. We, we have to make sure that we don't fall on either side. Only the tax fix, a tech fix, and not only the pessimist view. But uh, I think this needs to be discussed and evolving as many actors as possible, because I, one thing I, I, I think is very likely that the changes will be dramatic. Um, and hence, I think it's important to have, such, uh, have the discussions we are having right now. Thank you. Henriette, I'm afraid uh, your question would be very long if, I, if we asked everybody to, to give us a name. Just one name. So, st just one name that comes up. I, I know somebody who would like to be called. That's our Prince Andrew, uh, the Duke of York. He sees himself, well, he is a kind of ambassador for uh, UK industry, and he's very keen to talk about this topic. I know he wants, believes it's an area where we can promote our industry. Unfortunately, I don't have his phone number. If there occur any more phone numbers, please refer to Henriette after, after our talk. Uh, we still have five minutes to go. I would like uh, to make two quick final rounds. Uh, the first round, uh, I'll start with you, and we'll go into this direction. And the second round, I'll start with Martin, and we'll go into the back direction. The first final round will be, we've talked about what happened so far, what has not happened so far. I would like to know from you what will be the next necessary, important steps in order to be able to implement ITS, intelligent transportation systems, or autonomous driving in whatever way. It might be cars, it might be shuttles, it might be Katya-like drones in the air, in order to make that possible. So round number one, what is the next necessary step? One sentence each, please. Matthias, go ahead. I'm afraid I don't know. I think there is one great issue is the issue of standardization. I think um, that is something that needs to be addressed with regard to cities. Um, I think we just have to, uh, have to lead a discussion and uh, the Holy Trinity also, I think, needs to be reflected. Um, so uh, as a... Um, as a true believer, I still have my doubts, so uh, we need to ask a question also, um, yeah, what we think about that. Thank you. Arian. I would say uh, involve citizens, involve people, and um, change the design of cities, because they're actually making a paradigm. So. Thank you. Katja. Exactly what we are doing now, discussing it, with uh, various people from various different backgrounds and shaping uh, society as we usually do, and that's the same in autonomous driving. Thank you. From Great. a technical perspective, I believe the Holy Grail is a convincing way to mix autonomous vehicles with non-autonomous vehicles, and indeed pedestrians and cyclists. Without that system that is convincing, that enables us to mix these different traffic types in a safe way, uh, without putting pedestrians back behind barriers and cyclists wherever. Um, unless we can solve that problem, I don't see how we can take uh, the autonomous vehicles forward in, a, in an urban area. Thank you. Amelie. Um, something that we should all be learning as a society and, and um, renegotiating and rediscussing, and it's not one step, but a long way, is um, ownership and proprietorship. Um, I think we have to let go of the idea of owning things. Um, ideas, intellectual property, cars, and so on. I think we have to get used to the fact 
of sharing and I think um, and 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 um, trading and 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 new ways of of dealing with material property rather than owning I think that's something that's important thank you Martin fully agree on this perspective of having this social dialogue on our mobility perspectives but more in practice I would say establish different learning environments in a kind of triple helix manner that research industry oh, users so even it's a it's it's a quadruple helix because it's also public authorities there really to trial and to get in it and to interact with the specific users on on the on really these kind of specific applications like shuttles and whatever that you're aiming for and see what is their specific benefit and how we can shape the operation environments for exactly these kind of use cases. Thank you. Let me continue with my second question now and we'll go back. Martin, we'll start with you. Um, sometimes I ask people on the panel to look into the future 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, I don't want to mention a specific number, so that's why I'm asking you, what do you think, give us a short sketch, a short vision, what will mobility and transportation look like at the end of your life? So what will your experience be that you will still be able to make? That I can go to my final destiny <laughs> with the power of an app. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> I think it's it's really integrating different service options and getting me a transparent information about what's the impact of my decision and giving me options and and encourage me to plan and to share this information with others because then it's for the sake of the society. Thank you. Emily, your vision. I, I couldn't agree more. This is a very nice vision. Um, um, so I'm not uh, panning into this more. Um, something very, very basic and simple. I'm envisioning, to take it back to uh, the uh, actual topic of this discussion, I'm envisioning a city that is not full of parked cars. If you imagine how much space, public space, that is wasted on parking, it makes me sick. <laughs> I, I can't, uh, I, I, yeah, there, I, I don't have words for how much I hate cars that are parked. And I do own a car myself, so I'm, I am guilty of this. Uh, but I'm looking into a future of cities that are free. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Graham. So this has to be a social vision. Um, it's not a transport problem. But we need to have cities where people are, are free to wander. Um, we've seen improvements over recent years and we don't want to, to lose those due to this uh, new technology. We need to share our vehicles more and not just share them across time, so car sharing clubs, but we also need to actually share the space. And for me, this is both uh, a hope and a challenge um, that we will be able to, to do that more. Thank you. Katja. Um, I'd like to go back to something that Amelie said about us being primed by media for these dystopian futures where first the robots surface and then they rule us. Um, as one of my friends at Media Lab says, first we imagine the future and then we make it so. So I'd encourage everybody to think, think of a very positive future, to not go back to think that we are the hate of uh, civilization and it can't get better. It can get better a lot. And that, for me, is what's embodied in the mobility as a service based on a clever land use and city planning. Uh, and that it is not only for us here, but that it actually works where the people are living, and that's Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Thank you. Arian, your sketch of the future. Yeah, well, you're asking that from someone who's living in Amsterdam, and the model split in Amsterdam is 55% of all the distances are being made by bikes. And this is growing. And I think, so my vision would be actually that this would be part, I hope, of this future, and more significantly. Are we talking and about autonomous bikes? Well, there's a, there's a nice one, uh, first, April, uh, first of April joke uh, on, on YouTube, by Google, actually 
where they introduced the autonomous bike. It's, you have to f Google it. It's really very, very practical joke. Very, very well done. Now, but also we we did thorough research for the Amsterdam, let's say, city, and automated uh, vehicles are always slower than bikes. And if you go to the Holy, Holy Trinity, for uh, there's of course much to, to say of very urban areas for other distances, but for inner cities, I would say uh, be confident on, uh, let's say, the most, let's say, the ancient ways of, uh, of walking and, uh, and biking. And uh, that's the most sustainable, the most enjoyable, livable, and it leads to very healthy uh, people and uh, air, I would say. So. Thank you. Matthias, if I'm not mistaken, you're the youngest one here on this panel, so give us your biggest and, and most far away vision uh, to the future. I can give you my nearest insight first. It is easier to be on this side when the, when the question starts here than be on the first, uh, the first to answer. So um, my, um, I, I basically try to connect two of them because the, the, the project really started with the idea, wouldn't it be nice to get rid of all these parking cars? And wouldn't it be fun for an architect to answer that question? Because if you imagine that all the building typologies from the, from, the, from the single family home somewhere out in the city to the shopping center, everything from the entrance to the inner logic of the building is connected to the logic of the car. And this is a lot of work and a lot of fun work to think about it and redesigning it. So this is how the project started. And this certainly would be nice to have it as a future. And then there would, it, would be, it would be great if, if, the, if this city then would be possible to get around with bike or walking. So um, <laughs> it would be nicer if I was older, then the, then the vision would be closer to us. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's a hybrid. <laughs> it's a, a hybrid. A hybrid takes longer. Thank you. So when we talk about autonomous driving, we heard today uh, and I think that's a topic that occurred very, very many times, that it is a Holy Trinity issue. One part of this Holy Trinity is sharing. Thank you for sharing today your knowledge and your experience and your know-how with us. I think uh, that many questions and answers were an invitation to a discussion that will have to continue. And especially there is one lady in the audience still waiting for many, many names and phone numbers. So if you have so, you know who to address you to. Thank you, very, uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, I would like to make a final note. The MAC night today uh, is still going on until 11 p.m. So you please feel free to stay here with us and to discuss. And also all the exhibitions, also the exhibition Hello Robot is still open until 11 p.m. Thank you for joining and enjoy your evening, which is now cooling a bit down. Thank you. <laughs>